So, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Maura McElroy. I'm the uh, honorary librarian of the college, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all in the room to the the college um, for this year's Goodall Symposium, uh, which is entitled "Changing Minds: Neurosurgery and Psychiatry in 1950s and 60s." Before I introduce the speakers, I'm going to do a few housekeeping points, and hopefully. Uh, people will switch off their cameras and mics. Um, it's a hybrid event um, and our audience are here in the Peter Lowe Lecture Theatre and we've got people remotely from home as you can see and it's being recorded um, for our YouTube channel. So um, for those at home, um, could I ask you to turn off all your cameras and microphones um, for the duration of the talks um, and we can maybe, um, if you want to ask a question at the end, that's not a problem. There's going to be time at the end, about 15 minutes for a question and answer. Um, you can raise your hand if you're um, online. You can obviously raise your hand if you're here too, or whatever way you want to do it in the audience here. Um, but if you can do that at home, you're more than welcome to um, join in the discussion. Um, but um, we do have the chat function enabled, um, and we have people in the room who can see that, where you can put in your queries or anything like that um, at, at the time as we go along. Um, another housekeeping part is Microsoft Teams does have live caption function, and um, you can use that if you have any access requirements. But it's not quite perfect, and so our recording will have um, be fully transcribed with closed captions. But anyway, back to for those in the room, um, I can't tell you how happy I am um, to welcome you here um, for the first Google Symposium in three years. Um, who knew? Uh, in fact, uh, I should say this is the delayed 2020 Google Symposium which was supposed to fit nicely with their exhibition at the time, um, which was Great Minds, the Brain and Medicine, Surgery and Psychiatry. Um, and coincidentally today, it's Sir William McEwan's um, birthday, um, whose work was part of that exhibition. But I think it fits in nicely with their exhibition um, currently as well. But I can totally assure you that this is definitely worth the wait. So why are we here tonight? Well, um, Archie Goodall, he was a previous honorary librarian of our college. Um, and until 2019, we'd had an annual symposium in his name. Um, actually since 1965 and uh, I'm hoping that we can continue this annual tradition um, perhaps in years to come and reflect on the reason for the absence. I always start with, uh, I, I, I read extensively about Archie Goodall and I read a paper about him um, around the first International Congress in Medical Librarianship. I am the only librarian after all. Um, and it made me wonder what you'd think about our use of medical libraries today and technology. This is a hybrid event after all. Um, I often stop award rounds. Um, I'm a geriatrician, so I do lots of award rounds um, and use up to date or other um, sources, sometimes Google, I'm going to not lie. Um, I'm hoping that you would approve of our use of technology. In the article, though, um, he wrote about clinicians um, and uh, how librarians, and we have some of our heritage team in the audience, um, how they view clinicians. And uh, I thought this was quite telling, um, so I'm going to quote it. And it said, the librarian's conception of the clinical worker appeared to be of someone between a tyrant, a lunatic, mm -hmm. uh, and a babe in arms. Sometimes I'm probably all three, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can reflect on that too. But anyway, um, without further ado, I'd like to briefly talk about our speakers. And um, we have some amazing speakers tonight. We have um, Dr. Alan Beveridge. He is a retired consultant psychiatrist and is currently history and humanities editor of the Journal of the Royal College's Physicians of Edinburgh. He's an authority on the history of psychiatry and the author of the fantastic book, The Portrait of the Psychiatrist as a Young Man, the early writing of and work of R.D. Lane, 1927 to 1960. We also have Dr. Ian Smith, who is, I've been told in brackets, a semi-retired consultant, and I think you kind of said that tonight, um, in addiction psychiatry in Glasgow. And he's been involved in medical education and training on alcohol and addiction. He has a special interest in the history of psychiatry and the treatment of alcoholism in Scotland. He's got close links with the Centre of the History of Medicine at the University of Glasgow, where he was awarded a Welcome Clinician Short-Term Fellowship. And thirdly, but by no means lastly, we have uh, Kirsty Early, who is our Digital Heritage and Engagement Officer here at the College. She's a qualified anatomist and she specialises in medical visualisation, science communication and heritage. Um, the running order is going to be slightly different from some programmes that we had. We're going to start with Kirsty and Sloan Robertson in neurosurgery in Glasgow, followed by Ian Smith, um, which is entitled Changing Approaches to Therapy in Glasgow Hospitals in the Middle of the 20th Century. And then um, finally, Alan Beveridge on, on R.T. Lane in Glasgow. And then there'll be a question and answer session at the end. 
we're going to try to keep to time because I know I'm very conscious about trains and public transport and I heard taxis today as well. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce Kirsty, um, who's going to give her first talk. Thank you very much, Morvan. And good evening, everyone in person and online. Um, I hope you're really going to enjoy tonight and that you'll agree with me at the end of tonight that the talks have been fascinating and thought provoking. So no spoilers, but they'll be good. Don't worry. As Morvan said, my name is Kirsty Early and I'm the Digital Heritage and Engagement Officer here at the College. And it's my honour and task to give the first talk of this year's Good All Symposium. Now, not so much a talk, but more a story or a journey, my personal journey to finding a man. Um, an impossible task, some might consider that, but I'm not one to give up. Um, there were many challenges in finding this man that I'm about to talk about. One that is he's particularly older than men that I usually try and find, but I wasn't one to give up. This man that I was looking for went by the name of Mr. James Sloan Mutri Robertson. And there's a picture of him right here, which was provided by the University of Glasgow. Some of you in the audience may have known Mr. Sloan Robertson. Some of you may have even worked for him. But I bet all of you are thinking, why on earth was Kirsty looking for him? Especially since he passed away in the 1970s. Well, I was looking for Mr. Sloan Robertson because of an item in our heritage collection, this particular item here. A very peculiar looking metal box. Looks like it's something from Doctor Who, if you're a fan of that show. I don't actually watch it, anyway. Let me give you a bit of background on what I do at the college and why I came across this metal box. So part of my job at the college is to digitise the college's heritage collections. Um, so that involves photography, visualisation, as more than mentioned already. So the photography, taking photos of the items with the light box and the lights and all that jazz. Um, then editing the photos and uploading them to the heritage website for everyone to access. And we upload them with the relevant catalogue information um, and information on the item that we have. Sometimes we don't have a lot of information on the items. We actually have to do a bit of research into the items, what they were, how they were used, how they came to the college. And this is where, thankfully, I can look at the catalogue records in the college here. And I'll give you an example of one of the records now. So this is a sneak peek of a screenshot of our cataloging system in the college. I'm sure you'll agree it looks fascinating. Um, but this just gives basic information of some of the items in our collections here. So this is for the peculiar metal box. And if you look closely, it says, um, I'll just check, yep. The ID number is 2001-3. And the name of the box was Biphasic Stimulator. Now, as Barbara mentioned, I am an anatomist by trade, and I could take an educated guess at what this item was, but it didn't really get me anywhere. So biphasic, well, that sounds kind of like electricity. OK, might be electrical. Stimulator, well, it could be for stimulating muscles, for example. That's what it could have been. But that's pretty much all I had. I didn't have much more information. So I decided to look through the record again, see if I could find anything else. And this is when I came across this short biography and the first time I laid eyes on James Sloan Robertson's name. And this is really where my search began. So who was Sloan Robertson? Well, I didn't know who he was, except from, from this entry. So from this entry, I was able to find out that he was a Scottish surgeon during the 20th century and he specialised in neurosurgery. Um, he was definitely a pioneer of his day with many people coming to train with him. But he also trained with some of the greats himself during his time. So for me to talk about Sloan Robertson's significance, I need to give you a brief history of neurosurgery. It just it's, it's going to be a brief one, I promise. OK. So neurosurgery, surgery on the nervous system and all the odds and ends of it. Well, Operating on the brain and the head has actually been happening for quite a while. One of the oldest surgical procedures is known as trephination. And you can see a picture of a trephine just here that we have in our collection. Now, this dates back to the time of ancient Egypt. And the reasons for performing operations in those days would have been quite different to what we would do today. 
the understanding of the brain has been a long process and it's definitely one that we're still going through in history just now. But for example, in that time, if you weren't feeling well, you'd often go to get some help and they would maybe say, oh, we need to burn a hole in your head because there's actually spirits in your body that need to be let out and that's why you're not feeling well. So a lot more kind of superstition around some reasoning of health rather than the observation and experiment experimentation of the science of health that we see today. So they didn't actually know much about the human body, how it worked or what even it looked like so anatomy didn't really become a modern science until about the 1500s, which is when we have a man called Andreas Vesalius, who was an anatomist in Italy, who was the first to publish the first accurate anatomical textbook based on human dissections. Up until that point, anatomy was taught based on the teachings of a man called Galen, who was a physician in the time of the ancient Greek times. And he based his anatomical knowledge on animals rather than humans. So up until the 1500s, human anatomy was animal anatomy. And Vesalius was the first one to actually do it on human cadaveric dissections. So he basically kind of showed us, look, this is what the brain looks like. Then we have people like Thomas Willis, who showed us more about the brain and the anatomy of the brain, but also coining the term of neurology. And then we go into the 19th century, Still not knowing much about the brain, but knowing actually it's a no-go area for operation. If you operate on the brain, your patient's not going to survive. A fuller understanding of the brain didn't really happen until the late 1870s. For safe neurosurgery to occur, we needed a few things. We needed anesthesia, which came about in about the 1860s. We needed antisepsis, which again, 1860s was a popular decade for pioneering medical discoveries. Joseph Lister actually discovered antisepsis in Glasgow in the 1860s, but we also needed something called cerebral localization, and this was still to be established. So what is cerebral localization? It's a big, big term. So localization is essentially a surgeon's map to the brain. It is a map to the functions of different areas of the brain, and it's incredibly important for clinical diagnosis and obviously surgery as well. The idea of localization can actually be traced back to phrenology. Now, if some of you haven't heard of phrenology, phrenology was a pseudoscience particularly popular during the 19th century in Europe um, and in Scotland, especially in Edinburgh. And the idea of phrenology was that you could determine someone's personality or their characteristic traits by the shape of their skull. So if they had a particular bump of a particular part of the skull, that meant they were quite an angry person. Or if they had this shape, it meant they were really intelligent. It wasn't that scientific and it actually eventually got debunked. However, this idea that the head had something to do with functions of the body continued throughout the 19th century in a more scientific way. You see, the history of anatomy and the study of anatomy is all about damage, actually. When we figure out there's damage to a part of the body, then we can actually see there's a loss of function and then that that, body must, that part of the body must be part of the control of that function, that's how it worked. And that was the kind of research that was being done on the brain during this time. So we had Jackson's research on epilepsy, Broca's research into aphasia, and Ferrier's research into the nervous system on his experimentation of animals as well. They were all coming to this same conclusion, that the brain had specific functions and specific locations. All that was needed was a clinical application of localization, and this is where Sir William McCune comes into the story, who Morvan mentioned in her introduction. McCune's quite an unsung hero in surgery, um, and it's def he's definitely a big part of what we do at the college and what we talk about in our heritage, because he is actually um, a fellow of the college here. McCune was a surgeon in Glasgow during the 19th and 20th centuries, and he just was one of those people at school who aced everything and you probably didn't like, because it seemed that every specialty he tried, he pioneered part of it. So he pioneered things like neurosurgery, uh, bone surgery, prosthetic design, and also clinical photography as well. <laughs> he had a patient, so sorry, McEwen's up here in the corner here. He had a patient, young patient by the name of Barbara Watson, who's at the bottom here, a 14 year old girl, who at the time had a large lump over her left eye. So this was about in 1879. And she was having seizures. Now, McEwen was quite well read on um, neuroanatomy and neurosurgery in general as well. And he determined that actually this lump 
passed through the skull and was affecting the brain tissue. By antiseptic conditions and through her symptoms alone, McCune was able to remove this brain tumour. So this was the first clinical application of localisation. And it was the bridge needed to bring the theory into practical surgery. So as we go into the 20th century, people were pretty much agreeing, yep, the brain's got functions and yep, we can probably map them, but how on earth do you do that? Well, this is where um, Wilder Penfield comes into my story. Now, that's in there, playing American football, I think. Um, Penfield is quite um, a science hero of mine. I remember learning about him as an undergraduate anatomist at the University of Glasgow and just being fascinated by what he did and his work. He was the one that took up the challenge to mapping the brain. So what he did through his research in epilepsy, he was able to represent the somatocentry and the motor cortices. So that's this dotted line round about here. These cortices of the brain in a diagram that showed actually how much innervation was given to different parts of the body. So that's this diagram here on the right, quite a scary one. This is the homunculus. And this was really important to show that actually the brain could be mapped. He was able to do this through electrical stimulation of the brain during surgery. So the patient would be awake and under local anesthesia, and then he would stimulate parts of the brain and note the reactions of the patient. So did their finger twitch? Did they evoke a memory? Did they smell a certain smell? The homunculus would allow surgeons to navigate the brain and avoid healthy areas and actually figure out the boundaries of particular lesions that they could then resect. But what on earth does this have to do with Sloan Robertson? Mind that guy I was talking about? Well, Sloan Robertson actually trained with Penfield during his career. This is a picture of the two, two of them again from the University of Glasgow and later on in their careers. In the 1930s, Sloan Robertson was just gradu graduated and going to specialise in neurosurgery. And he became a Rockefeller scholar in Montreal, where Penfield worked at his institute. Also in the 1930s, Penfield was about to publish his findings into the homunculus. So it's not totally outrageous to suggest that actually during his time in Canada, Sloan Robertson could have been taught the early days of the homunculus, but also electrical stimulation and the importance of it in neurosurgery. After this, Sloan Robertson returned to Scotland to start really his career in neurosurgery in Glasgow and the west of Scotland. Part of that career took place at Calairn Hospital. I'm sure some of you know it and potentially worked there. Now, Calairn Hospital was set up as part of an emergency medical scheme in response to the Second World War, where they would um, cater to injured servicemen, pris um, prisoners of war and also local casualties as well. At Calairn was a specialist neurosurgical unit where Sloan Robertson worked and it was renowned across the country as being the best. It was here that Sloan Robertson worked with the likes of Eric Patterson, Joseph Shorstein and R.D. Lane, who you will hear about later on. He eventually moved to Southern General Hospital and at, at this time basically Clarence saw less and less action after the Second World War. Now that is a lot of admin to get back to the peculiar metal box but I promise you it's all relevant. So to figure out this box we needed to talk to someone who worked with Sloan Robertson. Thankfully at the college we have a lot of senior fellows here who are actively involved in the college and especially the heritage of the college. And a lot of senior fellows actually did work with Sloan Robertson. So after talking to these senior fellows, we were able to figure out that the biphasic stimulator was a piece of new surgical equipment used to stimulate parts of the brain, electrically stimulate them. And you would do that to figure out the boundaries of lesions, so for example, a brain tumour, and to safely resect it out of the body without damaging healthy tissue, while the patient was awake and consulted throughout. But we will also be able able to find um, notes with uh, calculations that were relating to the uh, item itself, calculations on voltage and the best practice for stimulation too. Now sometimes when we come across an item that doesn't have an easy identifier, we look for replicas, we look for duplicates in different collections, that's where we would Google um, and we've got instrument catalogues as well where we can look for duplicates too. Uh, you won't be surprised here there was no duplicates of this um, item at all. Um, and especially as you see that some of the writing on the, uh, a piece of equipment is pretty handwritten. So this led us to believe that either Sloan Robertson made this piece of equipment himself or worked closely with the engineer that did, potentially someone at the Southern General Hospital. So, from um, an unknown box to an innovative piece of neurosurgical equipment, 
from an unknown man to one of what can be considered the first modern neurosurgeon in the United Kingdom, definitely that Scotland saw. I thought my search was complete. I had found him. I'd even found a picture of him on the University of Glasgow's website. But there was a bonus treasure in my search. In the college's modern library in the reading room upstairs, there are several medical registers and directories that we have. Um, and we often have to consult them for family history inquiries. So one day I decided to check Sloan Robertson's career in one of the directories and see what came up. So this is one of the entries. Um, usual information, you know, where they, their address, their qualifications, any significant uh, publications as well. But then if you follow the laser here, I came across this, FRFPS Glas 1962. What that stands for is Fellow of the Royal Faculty of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, as it was known then. And I got very excited about this. I was like, he was a fellow. He had a link to the college, not just through this item. I got extra excited because in our collections, we have a book that lists the fellows of the college, which they have to sign on receiving fellowship. So I then went to that book and found this. Sloan Robertson's very own handwriting a two-year search and he was in the college the whole time. Thank you very much. Um, back to the holding slide. Um, thank you, Kirsty. Um, as I said, there's time for questions and answers at the end. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I love looking through the fellows book for all the signatures and things. I, I'm, it's, it's, if anyone gets a chance, Ross is going to kill me now when I see us come into the region <laughs> and have a look because it is very interesting. Anyway, um, thank you, Kirsty. As I said, um, our next um, speaker is Ian Smith, um, who's going to give us a talk now um, on changing approaches to therapy in Glasgow hospitals in the middle of the 20th century. Thank you, Ian. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good to be here. Two years in the the planning. Some some pandemic things seem to uh, occur and disrupt us. Um, I changed the title as as is my want. Um, so from from the asylum to care in the community. What? Why were the 50s and the 60s a sort of tipping point in, in relation to psychiatry? And it's, it's quite a stark change that occurs in psychiatric practice. So I, I was uh, a long time at Gartnaval Royal Hospital as a lecturer and then as a consultant, retired in 2019. And I now work part time, four days a week, part time mm -hmm. in Stirling as an addiction psychiatrist, which I'm enjoying. Um, but when I'm thinking about the tipping point, I'm thinking about this rather stark graph where basically the number of people in psychiatric institutions in the United Kingdom went up and up and up over the course of a century and a half. And then there's this dramatic downturn in the last um, 60 years. So what, what is going on here in terms of, you know, what, what magic occurred here and why, why did so many people end up resident in psychiatric institutions? Um, in 1955, say, the commonest single diagnosis that led you to be in an NHS hospital bed was schizophrenia. 90% of individuals who suffered from schizophrenia were in psychiatric hospitals. Today, 90% are in the community. So some, something dramatic happened at this point. Um, and, and so uh, one, one idea is we got drugs that worked. Um, that, re that allowed us to treat psychosis, introduction of major tranquilizers. But I think, I think there were other things going on at that point also. Um, th this was uh, an image that appeared in Time Life magazine just after World War II. Um, a, a Jewish refugee from uh, Nazi Germany working for Time Life, Eric Godal. Um, Bellevue Hospital in New York said, time life photographers cannot come into our hospital. 
but will allow an artist in. And and this this is the image that Godot uh, drew when he came out of, of Bellevue Hospital in 1946, having been allowed in. And this so this appeared in Time Life magazine. This this the scandal of our psychiatric institutions, people crowded together. So this this is what the artist represented. Um, so it was a tale of neglect and underfunding and certain principles of care that previously were known to work. You know, the more you put into care for the severely mentally ill, uh, the more you invested, the more space you gave individuals, um, the better they did in terms of their well-being. So this 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 was things gone badly wrong by this this point. Um, we, ha we have various kind of grand um, uh, histories of psychiatry. This is one, a history of psychiatry from the era of the asylum to the age of Prozac. I should mention that uh, Edward Shorter, Canadian historian, medical historian, his, his department was getting some money from Eli Lilly, but we'll pass over that, the manufacturers of Prozac. So, you know, a, a, a brand name for an antidepressant is being being name checked there. But um, um, historians kind of call this Whiggish history. You know, every, 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 things have got better um, because of the, the progress of science. And I think there's some truth in that, the, you know, the drugs that we got in the 1950s and 60s um, did make a difference compared to what we had before that point in psychiatry for, for severe mental illness, so chlorpromazine, imipramine, lithium, were a great step forward. And I think I think that's hard to deny. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to tell you the history of the main hospital in Glasgow. Um, so it, it, went, it opened in, in December 1814, the Glasgow Asylum for Lunatics. So you immediately think lunatics, that's a pejorative term, but at that time it was the technical term for severe mental illness and it didn't necessarily come with stigma. And that, that hospital was to last the people of Glasgow and the west of Scotland for 200 years. And um, within 20 years it was filled to overflowing and had to move to Gartnavel. Um, it got a royal charter in 1824, moved to Gartnavel in 1843. Um, changed its name, so it was no longer Lunatics, it was Glasgow Royal Mental Hospital, and then eventually Gartnavel Royal Hospital. And I think they, these were attempts to sort of destigmatize in, in relation to the institutions. Um, Gartnavel Royal Hospital, I have a long connection. I went there as a medical student. Uh, I met Martin Livingston and Dr. Reg Harrington um, and Professor Sir Michael Bond. Um, had a lovely summer elective in, in the hospital. My grandfather's rhubarb still uh, grows in the ground. Um, and, and I saw things that I never saw again in my psychiatric career, people with catatonia, uh, one of the last remaining patients with GPI, neurosyphilis. And when I came back in 1988 and I worked in the long stay wards, I never again saw anyone with a, a catatonic posture and so on. You know, I, in 81, I saw someone standing with a newspaper in one leg, another lady in a ball on top of a bridge where she spent the day. I can't, I, I can't recall, you know, something had changed in those seven years. Um, but we, we, we had um, a welcome grant to look at the history of our hospital and psychiatry in the west of Scotland. Uh, William Parry Jones um, helped with that. We had a historian, Jonathan Andrews, and we wrote a history called Let There Be Light Again. You can get this online now. The Wellcome Trust has hoovered up all the Gartnavel archives, and you can get it at the click of a button in your own home and look at 19th century case notes. You can read Let There Be Light Again. Um, we celebrated 200 years in 2014. And th this, this is a typical story of you know, not maybe not what the layperson would necessarily think about psychiatric institutional history. So originally, mentally ill people who went into institutions could be found. The, the hospital behind the tree here, the Towns Hospital, in the basement, shackled, and some were ladies and gentlemen rather than poor patients. 
And this alarmed, um, this is a close up of the, the hospital, it's no longer there on Clyde Street. Um, but it alarmed a man called Robert McNair, a sugar baron. He got money together. They had a circus in George <laughs> Square to raise money. And they built this, the Glasgow Asylum for Lunatics, which stood Parliamentary Road, Dobie's Lawn. Um, it, it's, it would have stood where the Governor Becky building is now in Glasgow Caledonia, Caledonian University. Students who know their history sometimes you call GCU the Looney Uni, which is, uh, anyway, we'll pa pass over that. But it, this hospital was a cross shaped building, a panopticon. It had wings for ladies, gentlemen, male paupers, and female paupers. And it was to cure insanity using moral treatment. And this, this uh, is in Naval Royal today, Robert McNair, he was founder of the 1814 hospital, Sugar Baron. And it's, very, it's, it's this enlightenment story of psychiatry that, um, you know, it goes back to the French Revolution. Here's Pinel, a famous psychiatrist, freeing the insane from Salpetrie Sol, and the Bicetra. And he, he introduced uh, daily rounds, case notes, stu studying mental illness as, as a real medical concern. Um, so I, I, it was to treat people better than they were previously treated when they were severely mentally ill. So I think I think asylums became a, a form of empirical research. We could see there were genetic connections between generations uh, with severe mental illness. We could see that you know diversional therapy activities, music arts helped. There was a big thing about fresh air, green spaces. There weren't many doctors in the 19th century, so three doctors for 600 patients at Garton Naval didn't go very far. But, you know, the nurses, um, uh, the, the attendants were to help achieve this. This is the sun emerging out of the cloud of mental illness, relucia, which means let there be light again. And, and, and that, that was the uh, title for our hospital history. So this this big uh, building in the west end of Glasgow, it was a greenfield site in, in the 19th century. Um, it opened six years after Victoria became queen and three years after she married Prince Albert. So if you go to the central door of West House at Gartney, well, there's there's Victoria and Albert to welcome you. And uh, a big a big bell you could ring, you know, night, night porter, night, night admission. Um, I, I had a, an interesting experience three weeks ago, first time I'd been back at Gartnavel in three years. I showed the great, great grandson of this man around the hospital on a Sunday afternoon. He's an actor in a, a television drama I haven't watched called Outlander, called Angus Yellowleaves. Um, thinking about writing about his grandfather, thinking of maybe doing some film about it, but he knew a lot of the, the family history. He, he even knew, and and you know, I'm going I'm going to try and present that psychiatry in Glasgow wasn't into sort of cruel therapies, but it, it kind of slips up a bit with Yaldis, who I don't think he did this to many patients, but he uh, he he thought masturbation in men caused insanity, so he, he put a, a metal pin in the penis to stop people masturbating. Uh, but I think it was just a few cases. But apart from that, the the treatments were were kind of benign, they didn't really have drugs, they didn't really use straight jackets, you know, they, 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 they were uh, different from what, what, what you might think in terms of um, what a psychiatric institution might have looked like. Um, and he was the first lecturer on insanity at Glasgow University. There you go, there's what a nurse would have looked like at that time in the mental hospital. This was the treatment, so rather than binding you up in a straitjacket and, you know, trying to uh, give you chemicals to knock you out, you sat in the grounds of the hospital taking the airs to calm you down. So it's, this was called tent treatment, so uh, <laughs> for the mentally ill. Um, and by the end of the 19th century, Yellowley sent all the poorer patients away to Gartlock and Woody Lee. 
won't have time to go into all, all that expansion of the mental hospitals. But if you paid, the more you paid, the more you would get in the way of attendance and, uh, you know, grand people. It's not, it's not what you would think a disturbed mental hospital ward would look like. You know, plenty of chairs you could chuck around and a piano you could break up. Uh, this was West House at Gartnaval Royal. This man came in as a very disturbed patient and he ended up being the postmaster and, uh, you know, for several decades in the early 20th century. Um, and and uh, so the, the nature of what Goffman, the sociologist, would call a total institution, you know, he, he lived out his life in the asylum, his initial disturbance of the mind settled down and he was given a job. <laughs> So it's, and that, in a way, that was the treatment. Um, and this is where you would have had your lunch, late 19th century, early 20th century. First Corinthians 13 is around the wall there. And then various sporting scenes, you know, like hunting, shooting, fishing. But the, the hospital had a bowling green, a cricket ground. In the winter, they would have curling and uh, they had a farm, etc. Um, but somehow it went wrong, so they started to get overwhelmed by numbers. So society was shifting care into the hospital. Um, so this is kind of jumping ahead, but the, you know we, we we probably didn't have effective treatments. Um, jumping ahead a couple of decades from Yowley's, along comes this man, 1921, studied with Kraepelin and Meyer. Alan, Alan will tell you more about him. Later, pre, later on, Edinburgh professor of psychiatry. We we have a professor of psychiatry from Edinburgh in the audience here with Professor Johnston. Two two professors. Well, yeah, from Edinburgh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so, um, but he he went to America, trained with Meyer, and when you look at his stuff and PhDs have been written about him, again, it is not biological psychiatry. It's social psychiatry, psych psychological approaches. Um, so the, the notion that there was a lot of biological psychiatry going on. Uh, Henderson, very critical of his forerunner, Oswald, that he had failed to get dementia pre precox in as a diagnosis, and that only started in 1921, but it was known about from 1895. Shorter thinks he's the central figure in the history of psychiatry. This is a workshop at Gartnaval, late 19th, early 20th century. So, you know, plenty of things for disturbed people to do damage with there. But no, the patients were sawing things and chiseling things. After Henderson came this man, um, I, I couldn't find the picture of him riding through the hospital grounds, his physician superintendent with his umbrella up reading a book. He was a bachelor from Mull. And he spanned the pre-NHS through into, well into the NHS era. Um, last physician superintendent to live in. And this this is what the hospital looked like um, when he was physician superintendent. Um, Henderson House isn't there, so that dates it before 1959. The nurses' home is there, so it's after 1933. So I think I think this is late 30s, early 40s, this aerial image. And McNiven, he he didn't allow psychosurgery to happen in the hospital. He didn't like ECT, he didn't like insulin coma. Um, he was very psychodynamic, psychoanalytic in his outlook, helped Jewish refugee psychoanalysts escape and establish themselves in Glasgow um, from the Nazis. Um, right, quiz question to waken you all up. Who said this in 1961? Shout it out. Enoch Powell, yeah, it's a good speech, actually, uh, unlike some of his other speeches that we won't mention. But, um, and, and it's always stuck with me, this idea of the water tower that he, he mentions, you know, and eventually Gartnaval's water tower went. Um, but he, so he was Minister of Health in 1961, and I think that they started to say that admissions to mental hospitals were falling away. And they were attributing that to propromazine and some of the new drugs. And they were thinking, oh, we, we're not going to need these big institutions anymore. We need to we need to start reducing. England reduced more than Scotland ever did. I think we always retain twice as many beds per, per 
capita than, than England, which is interesting. Um, after McNiven, Timber came, but the, the, we were starting to see the beginnings in 1960s of the, the sort of modern mental hospital. And, and time, time limits me, but there's Gat Neville General, which is still there, and we had a psychiatric ward in there. So when I arrived to work with Martin and his colleagues, we were in Ward 1A in Gat Neville General. So it was this idea we could normalise psychiatric practice compared to the rest of medicine if we had psychiatric wards in general hospitals. Very few remain, actually. It was an experiment, but very few. They might be on the same campus as a psychiatric, as, as a general hospital, but they're often at the end of the far corridor. I mean, that's the case in Fort Valley Royal. Um, the, the department in the Southern General went, and it's now all at Levendale, et cetera. Um, it's kind of interesting period, that. Um, so deinstitutionalization happened. I think I think the answer to that question, was it the drugs? Was it social change? I think it was both. Um, but it's hard, you can't really te tease out. I think I think effective antipsychotic drugs did have a lot to to do with uh, new psychological approaches. But I think I think at the same time society was saying, oh, too many scandals in mental hospitals, overcrowded, this can't go on, you can't just keep building new. Hospitals. I mean, at its peak, you know, Lennox Castle Hospital for men the mentally handicapped, Hartwood uh, Hospital, one of the biggest in Europe, Levendale, Woody Lee, Gartlock, Gartnaval had 700 beds. You know, I, I, I haven't done the maths, but I, th I think it would have added up to 8,000 people in beds in, in the sort of greater Glasgow and vicinities, at least at, at, the, at that peak. Um, so here's the new Gartnival Royal with the old Gartnival Royal behind it. And interestingly, the architects who made this drew on William Stark's plans for the original Glasgow Asylum for Lunatics. He wanted someplace that was airy, had lots of light. Um, and and they, they, so William Stark in 1810 wrote, wrote a, a, a tract on the design of a mental hospital. And the architects for this, they opened in the late noughties, read that and, and brought some of his design ideas in, into the hospital. Um, so this this is the entrance to the hospital. Um, we Each of the three hospitals have a time capsule. We've not found the one from 1843. We did find the one from 1814. And I know where the one from 2007-8 is buried, because <laughs> on the 1st of June, I, I was standing there watching it being you know, put down into the ground. So I could tell you which boulder it's under <laughs> if we ever if we ever take it up. And um, so this is, you know, high windows with light. So this is one of the upper corridors that got Neville Royal. And it's kind of, it's kind of like an art gallery of, of psychiatric art, psychiatric patient art. Um, you, know, you know, people are welcome to go and look in, in, within the hospital. But those, those, those hospitals um, started to diminish, rehabilitation psychiatry, people going out into the community, that, that big decline, um, deco antipsychotics, um, perhaps. And, and then we had, this was one of the earliest in Glasgow, community mental health resource centres. So this is in the Gorbals, this is Florence Street. I mean, some of some of the others kind of look a bit more modern than than, than this building. Um, so things things changed quite markedly. Um, th th there were one or two slides I hoped to sneak in, but for technical reasons, I couldn't. But um, th th there is a website where you can kind of do a virtual tour of Gart Naval Royal, um, and I think it is Gart. If you put in Gart. Oh, one Psy SPAC, so it's Garden Naval Psychiatric Spaces, but Gart Psy SPAC is the website. But if, if you search under Garden Naval Psychiatric Spaces, we, we had a European Union, remember that, grant, and we had a Swedish geographer came and studied us for a couple of years, and this, this was only like five years ago. And there's quite quite a wonderful resource that I, th I don't think we've been publicising or, or using enough, telling telling the evolution of psychiatry from 1843 
in that space, this huge space that was Gartnevo Royal Hospital in relation to patient care. And a lot, a lot still goes on there. So when I showed Angus Yellies around, he told me that, so his, his great grandfather had grown up in the asylum, Henry Yellies and, and his uncle, his great, great, great uncle, David Yellies. And the, their nanny was one of the patients who had delusions about Queen Victoria. And um, but his his great grandfather, um, yeah, his his school friends were a bit wary of him. Oh, he's in the big old mental hospital, and that's scary. And then and then they, he got them all his school friends to come round for a par a party in the physician superintendent's garden, and he was the most popular popular <laughs> student after that, according to. <laughs> to Angus and because uh, they had great fun and you can go and look in the wall garden um, and there's lots of therapeutic plants growing there and, and it's it's open in the gut level grounds. So I, I suppose I suppose the bottom line is amazingly not biological, certainly in gut level, no psychosurgery, some ECT, not much insulin coma. <laughs> mainly an ethos of care that probably goes back to that moral moral treatment idea that was in the, the you know the the york retreat and the pinnell idea you know treat people with kindness um and we may not be able to do a lot about their illness but uh, certainly we can improve their lot through through um kindness kindness and care um so that that's my talk yeah thank you very much <laughs> Thank you, Ian. I'm, I'm just going to do another plug for the college as well, because we have some um, uh, archives about Robert Cleghorn and John Bolmano, who were at the original um, um, asylum. You've got a page upstairs that belongs to Gartner. Yeah, we, well, and it's on loan. It's on loan. <laughs> it, it, it's our Henry Rayburn. Um, <laughs> it's on loan at the moment. Um, <laughs> Um, so if anyone's interested as well, um, there's been a few blogs about that. Um, we had some um, students from Glasgow University. I want to get this right. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, and uh, I'll look at West House when I go hot desking because I walk in that door and I've never seen Victoria and, and Albert. Um, so thank you for that. I'll look when I'm um, back there again. Um, so our final speaker of the evening is um, Alan Beveridge, who's going to talk about our dealing in Glasgow. So um, come up now. Thank you, Alan. Right. right. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for um, inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm going to speak about RD Lane at Gart Naval. And what I'd like to do is start with a, a clinical vignette. Um, if we go back to October 1954 at the East House of Garden Naval, there's a patient called Betty, a woman with a manic depressive illness. And she's seen by a young junior doctor, R.D. Lang, who has made notes of the encounter. And Betty says to Lang, why do you come here? Why don't you take another patient? I know what you'll say, that I'm testing out your feelings to see whether you're fond of me. Lane responds by reminding her of a dream she had a few days previously. She was running away, but as hard as she ran, she could not get further away, as she was being held here by a magnet. The feelings which held her here came from inside herself. Betty spoke about getting all her teeth out and wondered if her gums would be ripped. Lane responds, such fantasies had to do with the need she experienced to suffer pain and punishment in consequence of the fantasies. Two hours after the interview, the patient came into the room where Ling was sitting and poured a pail of water over him. She went out immediately, but came back five minutes later and said, do you think you will get pneumonia? Ling, I don't think so. Sometime later, Betty went on an overnight pass to her family home, but did not tell her parents she was allowed out. When they asked her to return to the hospital, she became convinced that her parents didn't want her. She went to Glasgow Central Station and broke windows in a train. When being returned to the hospital by the police, she broke 22 panes of glass in a frenzy of anger. She absconded from the ward several times again, and on one occasion was found in Great Western Road in her dressing gown. 
Two days later, she took an overdose of sedative medication after a visit from her sister. When Lang saw her the next day, he told her the story of the Chinese who, when they killed himself, do so on the enemy's doorstep. When seen again by Lang, Betty remembered the Chinese proverb and said, that's a good idea. You remember that? You said, just go ahead. She threatened Lang that she would not go back to the ward when the interview finished. Lang went to phone nursing staff to bring her back. and She promptly barricaded herself in the room and broke six windows. When she was taken out, she returned to the ward, laughing, jumping and skipping, evidently in high spirits. So this is just a flavour of some of the, the patients Lane was seeing and how uh, disturbed the Garrett Naval patients were during this period. Lane, as well as his notes uh, about the patient, had notes on countertransference or how the patient made him feel. And he says, I want to cure her. I want her to respect me. I find her praise of me more difficult to interpret as transference than criticism. I find I am too ready to discount the real intensity of her criticisms. I tend to identify myself with her, my problems with my parents. I see parallels. I want her to be concerned. I want to play a significant role in her life. So Lang is an Irish young uh, psychiatrist, serious uh, about his work and uh, thinking about what he's doing. So Betty was to become a Cathy in Lang's 1961 book, Self and Others. And her clinical notes are a part of the MS Lang archive, which is held at the Glasgow University Library Special Collections. So in this talk, uh, I'll give a brief account of Lang and his early biography, look at the background to Gert Naval, which we'll be hearing about with D.K. Henderson, Angus McNiven, and look at Lang's time at Gert Naval, in particular the famous rumpus room experiment, and his most famous patient, Edith, who became Julie, and then offer some concluding remarks. So who was R.D. Lane? Well, Ronald David Lane was, for a time in the 1960s, the most famous psychiatrist in the world. In his first book, The Divided Self, he argued that psychosis was more understandable than had been thought. And he favoured an existential approach, which he said revealed that the patient was an individual whose supposed mad alternatives were meaningful. However, Lane um, divides opinion. Uh, for some, uh, many psychiatrists, he enjoyed a fashionable notoriety in the 1960s, but uh, the view is that his uh, ideas about schizophrenia were dangerous nonsense, which gave the idea that parents were somehow to blame. And in this view, his writing is seen as irrelevant and the person is seen as an unstable charlatan. The alternative view, mainly held by non-psychiatrists, that at a time when the mentally ill were being neglected, he championed the cause of the mentally ill. He argued that mad were people too, and understandable. And in this view, the subsequent demonization by psychiatry demonstrates that psychiatry is wedded to a biological model and the defense of its power. So uh, his biography then, he was born on the 7th of October, 1927 in Glasgow. He was an only child. He attended Hutchinson's Boys Grammar School, where he was a gifted pupil, uh, excelling classical languages and literature. And it was his proud boast that he read his way through the collection of the local Govan Hill Public Library, taking in such luminaries as Freud, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. Then went to Glasgow Medical School and Lang is in the picture here on uh, the left in the front row. And this is what medical students look like in the, the 1940s, 1950s. And uh, when he qualified, went to Clern, a uh, new surgical unit, which we've been hearing about, and Lang is in the middle with his colleagues. He then was conscripted into the British Army, uh, working in Netley and Catterick uh, in England, but before returning to civilian life as a register at Gart Naval between 1953-1955. Then he became a senior register at the Southern Journal in Glasgow before moving to London in 1956 to work at the Tavistock. In 1960, he published his most famous book, The Divided Self, in which he said he aimed to make madness and the process of going mad comprehensible. He aimed to create a science of persons based on the principles of existential philosophy. And he followed the, this book up a year later with uh, Self and Others, in which he examined interpersonal aspects of madness. So I'll be concentrating on laying at Gart Naval. So the background uh, is Ardy Ling's time at Gartnaval, I think, was the most crucial experience uh, of his clinical training. 
He met patients with severe mental illness, and many of these were to appear in his first two books, The Divided Self and Self and Others. The Rumpus Room Experiment, which I'll go on to talk about, he was discussed throughout his career, and it was to assume a great mythological uh, aspect in his retelling of it. And his first experience of working in a large and overcrowded mental hospital. And although he was later to say that he was appalled by much of what he saw, he also spoke warmly about many aspects of Gart Naval. He talked about the camaraderie amongst staff, the essential decency he felt and humanity of older psychiatrists, such as the superintendent Angus McNiven, and above all the patients whose often strange and seemingly inaccessible world, world he attempted to penetrate. So when Lang uh, took up his post as Red Star Gart Naval uh, in October 1953, Patients' numbers topped 900, as Ian was saying, the numbers were growing and growing, and this was the first time it got uh, as large as this. And there was also a shortage of medical staff. And Isabel Hunter, who worked uh, uh, with Lane, uh, wrote a book about Glasgow psychiatry at this time, and she said the key to understanding Glasgow's approach to mental illness was to be found in the pages of Henderson and Gillespie's textbook of psychiatry. And just to take some extracts from this book, the authors write, we've made a point of quoting at length clinical records of cases in our practice. Mental illness is an individual affair. General descriptions of clinical syndromes, while interesting, are not of the first importance. What is wanted always is an understanding of the patient as a human being and of the problems which he is meeting in a morbid way with his symptoms which they put in inverted commas. A, so mental illness in terms of the social problems of everyday life, family discord, they said, could contribute to psychological disturbance. Mental illness should be understood in terms of the individual and symptoms had little meaning if considered apart from the specific context which the patients experienced. And this is very much what Lane uh, elaborated on uh, in his work. D.K. Henderson, who we've uh, been hearing about uh, and we've already studied with Kreplin Meyer, Superintendent Gart Naval, before becoming Professor of Psychiatry at Edinburgh, and wrote the textbook with Gillespie, Textbook of Psychiatry. Uh, another key figure for Lane was Angus McNiven, uh, who's from the Isle of Mull, also trained with Meyer, and had a signed portrait of Sigmund Freud on his wall. And he believed, like Lane, that there was no sharp dividing line between normal and abnormal functioning. And he was very sceptical about the new physical methods of treatment that were coming in during this period. And uh, as he has mentioned, he was instrumental in finding uh, work for refugee Jews, uh, psychiatrists fleeing Nazi Europe. And Lane in his autobiography conceded that Gartnavel wasn't such a bad place in many ways. It's full of eccentrics. And the patients were allowed to be far more eccentric than you'll find nowadays in modern hospitals. They won't put up with it. So uh, just to look at two major clinical uh, arenas for laying. Firstly, the rumpus room. This was a social psychiatry experiment where patients were taken from the so-called refractory wards, which were overcrowded and given uh, a more congenial environment with a higher staff to patient ratio. And the question was, would this improve their mental state? The uh, project had the backing of Professor Ferguson Rogers from the Southern General and also Dr. Angus McNiven. Laying, uh, it's important to point out, had co workers. It was Thomas Freeman, who was a Belfast medical graduate. He worked at Gart Naval, was also a lecturer in psychotherapy, and he worked with Maxwell Jones. It was John Cameron, a Glasgow graduate, who also worked at Calern. And it's uh, Cameron, not Lane, who initiated the practice of going into uh, the uh, refractory wards. In fact, the research was underway uh, when Lane joined it. And there was Andrew McGee, uh, a psychologist uh, uh, from Glasgow, who became a senior clinical psychologist at Gart Naval. So the refractory wards were in uh, the East House, and uh, Lane records going into uh, these wards as part of the research. And he, he writes about his experience. At first, bedlam, the patients are crowded seat to seat. And day room, I feel rather scared. I'm afraid my clothes will be ripped off or that I'll lose my balls. Several women are running about shouting, singing, laughing, swearing. Several approach me. One swears and pulls up her dress, exhibits herself. 
take some time before I can settle down to see more clearly what is going on. The noisy people who are setting the tone of the ward are only three or four out of perhaps 40 people. And he says, when I gave up intellectualising, I felt that occasionally I got a glimpse behind the veil of some of these mad creatures. And such a glimpse I still recall from of complete and utter hopelessness of nothing or non-being. And as well as uh, Ling's notes, there are this, the staff discussion uh, meetings which took place to discuss the research. And he's got a great insight into uh, the difficulties of the research as well as reflecting the climate of 1950s psychiatric hospitals. There was a debate uh, about the efficacy of chlorpromazine or Lagaptil, which was coming in at this point, uh, and the efficacy of social environmental approaches of psychoanalytical therapy. And uh, it was also noted in one of the meetings that patients not selected for the rumpus room felt jealous of those who had been. And they also noted that the disturbance amongst patients had reduced since Dr. Lane had taken to wandering around their factory ward talking to the patients. So the research was eventually uh, published in The Lancet. It's important to point out Lane is not the uh, first author because in his later accounts he uh, doesn't seem to mention the other uh, co-workers. So the conclusion in the article was, after 12 months, the authors felt that there had been many improvements in appearance and behaviour of the patients. They were no longer socially isolated. They took a greater interest in themselves. They were less violent and their language ceased to be obscene. The authors felt that the main factor in the improvement was not the change to a more pleasant environment, but that the nurses and patients had been able to get to know each other and form a bond, and the italics is in the original. They concluded that the barrier between patients and staff was not erected solely by patients, but was a mutual construction. So uh, th this research was looked at uh, much later by the psychiatrist Abramson, and he said that the original Lancet paper correctly made no mention of the patients being discharged for laying in his later accounts of it said all the patients had been discharged and they all came back 18 months later. And Abramson was able to trace six of the patients and found that none of them had been discharged. So Lane's narrative uh, of what he was doing is uh, somewhat suspect at times. And uh, just some observations on uh, the Rumpus Room experiment and Lane. It does occupy, as I'm saying, a key place in his narrative of the psychiatrist's progress. In his version, he boldly enters the foreboding and forbidden territory to the refractory ward. He enters his entry is fraught with danger, but our hero conquers his fears and his repugnance to remain with the excluded ones. His award is accepted by this estranged community and he begins to see behind their veil of obfuscation and learn their language. However, to be fair to Lane, he did show initiative, courage and perseverance in spending time in the front ward. He was afforded a perspective on the institutional world of the long-stay patients that few had sought to investigate. <clears throat> and he did try hard to understand this intimidating and perplexing world. And he did invest a lot of time and energy in the rumpus room. So uh, the final section is laying in individual patients. There's only time to talk about one patient, his most famous patient, Edith, who became Julie in the final chapter of the divided cell, the ghost of the weed garden. And uh, uh, Edith or Julie was seen originally by Dr. McLevin when she was 17. Uh, she was hearing voices. She thought a girl wearing her clothes had been killed, accused her mother of not bringing her up properly. And Lang met her in 1954, conducting 180 interviews amounting to 250 hours. So he was spending a lot of time with his patients, a lot more, I think, than the, the average psychiatrist these days. So he made notes, uh, extensive notes, and I'll just have some extracts. And in this, Lane is adopting uh, what was called direct analysis, where you use analytical methods to somehow enter the mad world of the patient. And it has to be said, when you read the transcripts, it's difficult to tell who's the patient and who's the doctor, I think, as you'll see. He just says to him, I have no tongue. I have a tongue, but it's not my actual tongue. Lang says, you have a tongue in your mouth anyway. Edith, yes, I have a tongue in my mouth, but it's not my actual tongue. I have no actual tongue. And uh, Lang writes, I was a bit lost at this point. Tongue equals nipple equals penis. She had apparently lost her tongue and hence couldn't speak. Had she been weaned, bitten off and swallowed nipple, 
how lost it, frustrated, but what level of regression to work on. So laying is operating from a psychoanalytical uh, perspective. And he says, well, I'm glad to hear that in a way. One tongue in your mouth is enough for anyone. Edith, I have a tongue in my mouth. It peeks up from her between her teeth rather coyly. Laying, you won't lose that tongue. That other tongue never really belonged to you anyway. You must have pinched it from somewhere. You've at least 10 nipples anyway. Edith, I was married. Laying, to your father? Edith, to Dr. Laying. Dr. Laying cut out my tongue in Africa. I previously suggested that her mother had cut out her tongue for marrying me in Africa. And she said, Dr. Lane cut out. I was completely taken by surprise. Silence for some time. And Lane also used the doll as a means of encouraging Edith to talk. I addressed myself to doll, mostly saying that her name is Edith. She's a beautiful little baby girl. She'll die if she's not loved. Someone has to feed her milk. Someone's got to take her to the bathroom. Someone has to change her nappies. She, the doll, has found a mummy who's going to do all these things. He told Edith a story about a little girl whose mother didn't want her. Because she was an unwanted child, she went into a corner and died. And now she is the ghost of the weed garden. But I want that child and she's going to live for me. And Edith listened to, uh, to this in silence and smiled at the phrase, the ghost of the weed garden, which was her own. She remained silent for some time, then looked at Lane and said simply, Thank you. So Edith appears as Julie in The Divided Self. And in the book, Link trans translate Julie's speech with the tools that were available to him at the time, such as existentialism and psychoanalysis, objects relations theory. And he also uh, relied on literature, uh, William Blake and Ophelia. And uh, he does provide a plausible, poetic, and for some, a compelling explanation of Julie's seemingly incomprehensible language and behaviour. But we have to ask, is an accurate account of her condition? And the comparison of his clinical notes with the published version suggests that he used also dramatic license in his portrayal of Julie. So uh, just some observations on uh, to end with uh, on laying an individual patients. His clinical notes uh, in the archives allow us to travel back over a half a century and eavesdrop on his conversations with patients, which he conducted in this busy, noisy, uh, crowded institution. He comes across as astute, physically brave and dedicated, and he was also influenced by the psychic ideas of his time, especially the belief that the mortified psychoanalysis was the best approach to patients suffering from a psychotic illness. What also comes across is the personality of the patient, more so than in his books, we hear the patient's voice directly. And many of these garden naval patients challenge Ling, oppose his interpretations of their symptoms, and suggested their own ideas as to the nature of their problems. And in the divided cell, some of these patients are described in a way that renders them rather insubstantial. In Ling's notes, they seem more real, more colourful, more assertive. And we see that the clinical encounter as a two-way process and we have a better idea of the context in which the patients express themselves. So in conclusion, uh, looking back at his time after he moved to Townstock, Lane judged, that's where I felt I went down the drain in my career. And he was plainly more at ease with the severely disturbed patients of Garden Naval than with the clientele of the Townstock, whom he considered to be relatively normal and dull and boring, he also added. <laughs> So I would argue that Ling's time at Gart Naval was the most crucial experience of his clinical training, and although he greatly played down in later years, he benefited enormously from his immersion in the existing science culture of the hospital and from his encounters uh, with the patients of Gart Naval. Thank you.